Hello, everyone. I'm Rita Alcair. I'm a postdoctoral student here at the Center for Social Studies in Coimbra. I am also part of the organizing committee of the Rekindling of the Civic Imagination for Social Change Summer School. The summer school started today and will go on until next Friday. And the, um, the talk that we'll be going to listen to today, right now, is entitled Flying Cars and Bigots, Projecting the Post-COVID World Through the Atlas of the Civic Imagination by Professor Henry Jenkins. It's the keynote lecture of our summer, summer school. And I want to show you something, show and put it out there. This book, and I cannot see myself, so I don't know if this is popping up in the image or if I'm just showing part of the book. Let me try to see myself. So I want to show you this book because this book had a huge impact on me and on the work that I, on thinking critically about the work that I had done and about the, the work that I want to do from now on. And this is the main inspiration for our summer school. It's called Popular Culture and the Civic Imagination, Case Studies of Creative Social Change. And it's by Professor Jenkin and his team. And it's a wonderful collection of case studies from many parts of the world, addressing the interaction between popular culture, progressive culture, and progressive activism. So the debates that we are having in the summer school throughout the week are pretty much informed by what we read here. And we are discussing many cases from Portugal and from other parts of the world, but that are related to our work at the Center for Social Studies. And we have Professor Henry Jenkins uh, today with us. He's a Provost Professor of Communication, Journalism, Cinematic Arts and Education at the University of Southern California. And he is the founder and former co-director of the MIT Comparative Media Studies Program. He has been dedicated advocate for media literacy, education, recently receiving the Jesse McKenzie Award for his lifetime contribution to this field, including the publication of Confronting the Challenges of Participatory Culture, Media Education for the 21st Century, which helped to launch the MacArthur Foundation's Digital Media and Learning Initiative. Subsequent work here included reading in the participatory culture and participatory culture in the networked society. His other work on children and media includes the Children Cultures Reader from Barbie to Mortal Kombat, Gender and Computer Games. He is currently writing a book on which examines children's media of the 1950s and 1960s in light of shifting understandings of childhood in post-war American culture. His most recent books include Participatory Culture, Interviews, Popular Culture, and the Civic Imagination, this one that I've showed you. I just wanted to tell you that this book is available at our library, our North-South Library will be available in a few days when I take it back. But you can check it out, and it's a very interesting read. So after this presentation, I just want to uh, open up the floor for you, Professor Jenkins. So Professor Jenkins, the floor is yours. And thank you so much on behalf of the, the organizing committee of the summer school for being with us uh, today. Well, it is a great honor for me to be with you today. And I'm especially honored to be engaging in a conversation with you around our mutual interest in civic imagination. It's been almost a decade since I was last in Portugal. So it's through the magic of Zoom that we're able to talk today. And I'm thrilled to have a chance to pick up this conversation. Uh, in the talk that I'm gonna to give, to, it's fairly traditional to say that a talk is a work in progress. In this case, it's very much true. The first part of this talk will take us through the trajectory of work my research team at USC has gone on in our efforts to understand civic imagination. And I'll talk a bit about what that term means for us. And then the second part is very much almost raw data, raw materials we're sorting through right now to try to understand this initiative, the Atlas of the Civic Imagination. And I'm throwing them out there to get your insights and your reflections along with me about what we're finding as we talk globally about the impact of COVID and on the, the civic imagination. 
as I do this, oops, just a second, as we do go through this, uh, I want to make clear that this is a collaborative effort. I've listed myself and Sangeeta Shrestova, my primary research collaborator last year, because in its current form, the work on the Civic Atlas has really been led by this team of PhD candidates at USC Cinema School and the Annenberg School of Communication. And I've listed their names here for us. Uh, I began with two quotes. The first is from someone named Montserrat from Mexico City, who writes in response to the prompt that we're gonna talk about in just a little bit, that 2060 will not be a utopia or a dystopia. There might be flying cars and clean energy, but some basic human emotions will remain. We will still have to fight for equality, for justice in a world for all of us, despite our differences. This requires hard, hard work. A Holocaust happened and we didn't learn to stop picking bigots as leaders. But we're also a world with rebels who fight for justice and equality. And what I like about this quote from the materials we've gathered so far in our Atlas project is that it captures this coexistence in people's thinking between utopian thought and dystopian thought when they imagine what our futures might look like. And this piece next to it is art drawn by Montserrat uh, as part of her submission. I want to juxtapose this with uh, a quote from the pedagogue uh, Henri Giroux, who wrote in late 2020, reality now resembles a dystopian world that could only be imagined as a harrowing work of fiction. And as ominous as this foreboding appears, history is open and how it unfolds hangs in the balance with young people and others rising up across the globe, inspired, energized, and marching in the streets. The future of a radical democracy is waiting to be reimagined, if not reborn. Democracy needs to breathe again. And I juxtaposed this with just some of the images of last year around the world and the experience we've had together and separately of a global pandemic. So, in this talk, I'm using the term civic imagination to describe the capacity to imagine alternatives to current social, political, or economic institutions or problems. Put bluntly, one cannot change the world unless you can imagine what a better world might look like. And that's kind of the cornerstone for the work that our civic imagination project, which has been funded by the MacArthur Foundation, as sort of focused on. So the Civic Imagination Project led in part to a series of books. We see here in this picture, Pop Culture and the Civic Imagination, already mentioned, and Practicing Futures, the newest of the two books, uh, which I'll also speak a bit about now, but it's also led in post, particularly in the pandemic era, to a series of online initiatives, including the Atlas of the Civic Imagination, the Out Our Window project, where we asked people to submit through Instagram what they saw out their window during the pandemic, and a toolkit that we've developed for parents to think work with homeschooled kids here in the US and elsewhere, thinking about how they can build imagination around media that they're consuming, trying to push back on this idea of screen time as a limit or problem and recognizing that once we're all in lockdown, everything is screen time, screen time. And what we need to do is think about how we're using screens and what we're using them to do, and not just whether communication is taking place through screens or not. So we're gonna talk about a bunch of those things here. Our work on the civic imaginations informed by a number of other writers who came before us. Uh, we. The, this book, The Civic Imagination, Making a Difference in American Political Life, has a somewhat more realist-driven notion of the civic imagination than we do, but really introduced the sociological study of how people think about the political process. Uh, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas's book, The Dark Fantastic, 
use a genre theory of children's lit to think about how we think about differences. We've been reading very closely this past year the work of Octavia Butler, and particularly Parable of the Sower, which for those of us in California has almost become a key text for us to think about what's been happening out our windows. Robin Kelly's book, The Black Radical Imagination, and Haven and Kashna Bish's The Radical Imaginations all contribute to our understanding of the civic imagination. Lately, we've been really reading and debating the work of Paulo Freire, uh, the Brazilian educator. And from a, this is a passage from the teacher is culture worker that we keep circling around. And it says the imagination that takes us to possible and impossible dreams is always necessary. It is important to make it clear that imagination is not an exercise for those detached from reality, those who live in the air. On the contrary, when we imagine something, we do it necessarily conditioned by a lack in our concrete reality. So Freire is urging imagination, including imagination of what possible schools might look like as a central part of the educational process, not as escapism, but as a way of surfacing underlying tensions and problems in the lives of students and getting them to hold open possibilities for change. And that's very much in the spirit of how we use the term civic imagination. So our approach was, is rooted, first of all, in the term I used often throughout my writing, that of participatory cultures. Uh, we build on insights on fan practices, uh, which center on critical and creative engagements with popular culture. They are committed to collective imagination and social agency. Again, collective agency as much or more than individual agency. And we're interested in the connections between cultural practices and civic and political action. And those kind of provide the cornerstone of this work and explain how it connects all the way back to my work on fandom through my book, Textual Poachers, almost 30 years ago. So this has been an ongoing trajectory in my intellectual perspective that I continue to pursue what does it mean to participate in our culture and why is cultural participation meaningful as we think about all aspects of our lives. So about a decade ago, we began this work on the political lives of American young people that was funded as part of the MacArthur Foundation's network on youth and participatory politics. And we looked at first fan activism that the work of the Harry Potter Alliance and nerd fighters. We looked at Muslim youth in the United States. We looked at dream activists, young people fighting for rights, uh, young, young immigrant youth, immigrant youth fighting for educational and civic rights, political rights. We looked at a libertarian group, Students for Liberty, and not depicted here is uh, the CUNY 2012 campaign conducted by the group invisible children. And those provided the case studies for our book on the new youth activism, which we called By Any Media Necessary. And that book came out in 06, or, or, or I'm sorry, 2016, just as the presidential election was heating up in the United States, the election that would result in Donald Trump becoming president, uh, and sort of, which sort of went against every youth group that we were studying in our, uh, in our work, including the libertarian youth who often were strongly opposed to Trump's politics and policies. The newer book that was held up at the beginning, Popular Culture and the Civic Imagination, was the next step down this journey where we look at case studies of 30 social movements and the ways they use popular culture as resources for forging creative social change. Uh, and, we, and these are just a few of the case studies that we look at in that group, everything from Hunger Games and Ms. Marvel to the Radical Monarchs, which is a kind of Girl Scouting organization out of Oakland, to Hamilton and Bollywood, 
to mural culture in Los Angeles, to Smokey the Bear, a symbol of environmental issues in, in, in the United States. And we just wanted to map out there both the theory of the civic imagination, which is the introduction of that book, and then a series of illustra examples illustrating that, about half of which <laughs> were written by the students and our own research group, and the other by and more advanced scholars whose work has influenced ours uh, in one way or another. So, but coming out of that initial work, we then went and we began going into the field. We were inspired by some of the groups we studied who were young activist groups and the ways they were already building on popular culture. And we took from them this concept of the civic imagination. And what we were been seeing is around the world, young people are forging politics through vernaculars drawn from popular culture that tap the imagination in order to inspire change. And so we thought, could we take the tools of fandom, tools from science fiction and speculative fiction, things like world building, and bring them into communities of all kinds to see if we could foster important conversations about the changes they were confronting, about trying to find shared values, particularly coming out of the 2016 election. I'm a native from the state of Georgia, which is a red state. It's a state that went heavily for Trump uh, four years ago, went for Biden this, this year. So that state left me concerned with what was happening in my native South in the so-called red states, but we also wanted to work with groups elsewhere to think how we form, how communities could work across differences and form some solidarity around social civic change. We set certain ethical and civic boundaries. We're not going to work with hate groups. We're not going to work with the Ku Klux Klan. We are willing to work with conservative groups, religious groups, uh, you know, uh, civic groups, governmental groups of all kinds. And you'll see here, for example, a Muslim youth group that we wrote about in our previous books that we now partner with. We, you see here freedom schools for immigrant youth. We see here a Lutheran church in Fayetteville, Arkansas, a labor hall in Bowling Green, Kentucky, the Salzburg Academy for Media and Global Change, where we participate in a summer program, and a lab in Beirut, where we brought together leaders, educational and journalistic leaders from 10 Arab countries to participate in our workshops. So those are just some of the places where we've done our work over the last year. We've done about 60 of these workshops ourselves now, and about 30 more have been done uh, by a group in Pakistan that's trying to think about how citizens there think of their nation. Uh, all of that got written up in the newest book, Practicing Futures, a Civic Imagination Action Handbook, which provides both instructions on how civic groups around the world and educational groups could use our techniques to foster their own civic workshops. And it includes uh, accounts, field reports from the, some of the sessions that we've done and the insights that emerged through those processes. Uh, all these workshops are designed to encourage and foster active participation. Uh, so inspired by the work of Peter Dahlgren, who says one has to feel invited, committed, and or empowered to enter into a participatory process. And by own, my own work, which writing about participatory education, says that it's defined by relatively low barriers to entry, support to create and share content, informal mentorship structures, the, and the belief that con contributions matter through social connection with each other. And in my writing, I talk about participation as a utopian goal, meaningful in the ways that it motivates our struggles to achieve it and provide yardsticks to measure what we've achieved. So one of the most recent things we launched through the process, uh, the project on civic imagination 
was what we call the atlas of the civic imagination. And the atlas you can find at the URL listed here. You, you can see a fairly recent snapshot of our map. Each of those represents uh, one or more contribution from those from people in those regions around the world. This was not intended as a research project per se. It's an artistic intervention and political intervention. Our goal was to stimulate reflection by people around the world about what they think the post-COVID world might look like. So here is the prompt we sent out. And if anyone there knows groups that might like to respond to this prompt, it's still active. You can still submit stories at the Atlas. Uh, think about the current moment, your situation and what you see around you, your fears and concerns. Take a deep breath, inhale, exhale. Now think about something that inspires you, a story from popular culture, folklore, your faith, your childhood. The story could be nonfiction, fiction, or even fantasy. It could be something you have noticed happening around you. It could be a story about a person in your life. Imagine it is now the year 2060 and the world is as you would like it to be. And that last part, as you would like it to be is key. We're not projecting actual futures. We're asking people to imagine what a better world would look like. So what is possible in 2060? How do people live, engage, move around, learn, communicate, work, take care of themselves, etc.? So one of the things we found in doing our face-to-face -face workshops was that people often needed to imagine the world in total meltdown mode before they can imagine the situations they were most concerned about changing. We heard all kinds of stories of apocalypse, of things falling apart. And out of that, it then became possible to imagine other, poss other options. So for us, the year 2060 is not a magic year. It is simply a year far enough out that we escape what Stephen Duncombe calls the tyranny of the possible. That voice inside us that said, well, it'd be amazing if we could do this, but we really can't because we don't have the money, there's not the political opportunity, so forth. We wanted people to move forward enough in time that they can imagine the current political crises affecting their culture being somewhat resolved enough so we could move things forward and close enough in time that we can imagine possibilities addressing our lives and mattering while many of us are still alive. And so 2060 became a year we use to do that speculative world building kind of work. So what, what we asked then were people to submit their stories. And, and what remains, I'm gonna walk through just some of the kinds of stories that we heard, some preliminary insights we're drawing from those stories and leaving them as raw materials that maybe we can think through together as we think about what a global civic imagination is looking like at the current moment. So we use this to take samplings. They're not representative, it's not a quantitative, survey in any meaningful sense. These are just voices of people who chose to participate. We have some countries, particularly the developed Western countries, as overrepresented. Some countries, Africa, for example, those in Africa, for example, underrepresented significantly. But that is a product of where we're at right now in terms of people voluntarily submitting. So Lilith from Mexico City wrote to us, we still remember 2020. And think about this phrasing, remembering 2020, when Lilith is writing in 2020. People remember how the world stopped and society hit the reset button. Remember tenderly how much damage we caused to our planet and how the pandemic brought us back together, although it physically separated us for a while. Each person sought from each, for each other as they sought for themselves and it caused an improvement in our environment. It brought changes we never thought could be reached in such a short period of time. Thinking about 2020 reminds us that when people working together, with pe the pe when working together, marvelous things can be attained. 
It also humbles us down because the virus took over our lives catastrophically and made us learn how insignificant we really are against nature's simple organisms. So the sense here of sitting, hitting the reset button, of rapid change that we didn't think was possible, of remembering the current moment and imagining the future simultaneously is the kind of temporal mode that we saw crop up often in these framings. How do we think to our way to an alternative future than the one that threatens us at the current moment? Nye also from Mexico City tells us, my negativity comes out as optimism for the future and a love for the past. And again, think about this temporal flux, optimism for the future and a love for the past. We have not made the progress we would have liked and I cried and feared for most of my life. We almost ended up killing all the species on earth. We broke out in war. The human project is scarred. Now in the year 2060, I realize that it still wasn't the end. Beauty can be found forward and behind. Nothing is like we were told, and now we look back at our mistakes and achievements. Unready, but at peace. So some of us have talked about COVID time and the sense of temporal haze or blurring that's taking place in the last year, where we have trouble remembering when things took place. And to some degree, this is a variant on that, where we are imagining forward and backwards, trying to understand the current moment in terms of how it fits within a larger trajectory of human history. So one of the striking things is we often think about utopia and dystopia as radically separate from each other, as different genres even within the realm of speculative future fiction. And here I see, this is a solar punk image of a, of a more utopian future. Solar punk is a current movement in science fiction that seeks to develop sustainable visions of the future. And this is a more dystopian vision of the future as in a lot of post-apocalyptic science fiction. But if we look closely at science fiction, what we see is utopia exists in dialogue with more dystopian views. Almost every utopia is an implicit critique of aspects of the present that are more dystopian. And most dystopian stories include within it representations of resistance movements, movements that are fighting to change the bad world into something something better. And I think what we in critical theory or academia have trouble doing is thinking in both of those modes simultaneously. I'm often told that I'm not critical enough in my writing, that I don't have a strong enough critique. And in part, it's because I see myself as counterbalancing an overemphasis on critique and much of other academic writing. For me, critique is one stage of a larger process of social change that requires analysis and documentation of current conditions, a critical judgment on those conditions or what we call critique, the, the development of alternatives that we advocate for and some kind of cultural and political intervention that pushes us further toward achieving what we see as viable alternatives. So to stop at critique is, a, is to stop at a point of arrested development. There is room for academic work that goes beyond critique, that acknowledges the value of critique, that takes as given the critiques that others has offered and develops a model for how change might take place. And I see civic imagination work as going beyond critique, not stopping before it gets to critique. And it does so by recognizing this relationship between utopian and dystopian thought that I just described. And it does so by recognizing the importance of collective civic agency, the possibility for change. And again, I go back to Peter Dahlgren's work on the civic cycle or the cultural processes of how people educate themselves, mobilize, become active, imagine alternatives and work to achieve them, which very much underlies the model of civic imagination we've developed. I'm also drawn to the work of 
the Latin, Latinx uh, writer Gloria Anzalala Zalda, who tells us that imagination is active, purposeful creativity that bridges the body to nature, spirit to mind. Imagination offers us another way of knowing and doing, a process that extends perception beyond bodily confines, transforms our consciousness and our perception from ordinary reality to a spiritual, magical other reality. Imagination helps us to cultivate a pretend reality and is act as though you, you're already in that pretend reality. Eventually, that reality becomes the real one, at least until you change it again. So again, she has a vision where imagination is foundational for social change. It's not something outside it. It's not escape from social change. It is the vehicle for changing the world. So we gather these stories together. So far, we've collected more than 200 such stories from people all over the planet. And we collectively tag them, organize them, identified underlying themes. And then in this project, we've begun to lay out some of the things that we're hearing consistently across these stories. And I'm gonna present a series of quotes from the stories so that you can think here for yourself what some of these voices sound like. Here, Ch Kelly from Chandler, Arizona writes, the future will be eco-friendly, egalitarian and kind. Perhaps over the next 40 years, people will change their minds and new policies will usher in a golden age unlike any other in history. Maybe this is too optimistic, but this is how I would like to picture the future. This is how I overcome all the terrible things that are happening today. There are 40 years between now and 2060. That reminds me of the biblical story where the freed slaves from Egypt spent 40 years wandering around in the desert before they found the promised land that God had chosen for them. Perhaps some of us will not live until 2060, and it's even more unlikely for our parents, but it is our children and grandchildren who will determine the future, and I hope they will create a future that is much better than the present we live in. And you'll recall that we asked people to draw on stories that inspired them, and this is one of the examples where a religious story becomes the foundation for someone's civic imagination. So a lot of the themes that crop up have to do with sustainability, climate and the environment. So uh, Purnima from Delhi, India writes, 2060, the air is so clean, we take blue skies for granted now. The streets are lined with lush green unruliness. No one trims or edits nature anymore. The only motor vehicles that exist are for public transportation. Money isn't our primary mode of transaction now. We depend a lot more on our neighbors than ever before. Everything is slowly. We move at the languid pace of cows. We have the disciplines of wasps building their nest. We keep things simple like street dogs. We've understood that we are part of, bigger, of a bigger whole. The trees are kings and queens. They rule us, we live in their shade. And so there's this beautiful poetic language here of living in harmony with nature that is part of Parima's more utopian vision for the future of the planet. And this is consistent with what we heard elsewhere. So Kate from Vermont in the USA, a key thing has changed between 2020 and 2060 if there's equal pay for everyone, no matter race and gender. This changed because why people differently why pay people differently because of these details, especially if they're doing the same job and working the same hours. It doesn't make sense. And the unequal pay was causing outrage by many and for good reason. Another thing that changed was the people on earth now have limits on the things they're putting into the environment like fuel, trash, greenhouse gases, et cetera. People are doing this to help the global crisis of climate change and is noticeably helping. So this connection between sustainability and equality or more egalitarian social structures crops up again and again in the stories we heard in various parts of the world. Steve from Detroit says, upon seeing the down spike in emissions during the pandemic, we drive, fly and pollute less. The air is cleaner. You could safely swim in the Chicago River. 
we still aren't perfect. Many of our current problems are still rampant, but we are more conscious on the, the, the safety of the people and the world around us. People remember 2020 as a disruption before the new normal. And again, this connection between environmental issues, human rights issues, the ways they're coupled together is part of a kind of shared civic imagination we see cropping up often in these uh, countries. Here, Delik from Istanbul writes, chaos came with its healing glare. Yesterday's daunting destruction bared tomorrow's hope and salvation. After all, it was in the hands of the people. Decades passed with moments of upheaval. One learned to listen, to empathize, and to respect. The humankind needed to acknowledge the neglect. So empathy, respect, active listening are skills that are identified often in the entries that we received. And technology is less present in these stories than you might imagine. So given how often we think about the future, we imagine technological change as driving everything else. It does crop up, but often in unexpected ways. So Emmy from Vermont told us, it starts out, starts out as a future civilization with a benevolent robot as the controller of the world. But eventually, rather than the robot trying to take over the world, the people dedic are dedicated to curving overpopulation and start murdering people to gain control of society. And the robot who actually loves people can't do anything to stop them. In this society, for the most part, it's euphoric until this happens. So he imagines a robot ruled society as more benevolent than a human ruled one as one where people are doing damage and robots are fighting to prevent them. And it's a kind of reversal of something like the Terminator, which imagines the war of machines versus man. It's a rather interesting contribution to how we think about the role of technology in a future society. Halisu from Illinois told us, the key thing that has happened between 2020 and 2060 is that the doomsday clock in Times Square, New York, has run out of for many years now. Climate change is now irreversible, all because of the greedy humans that stole too much. When the clock initially hit zero, humans all thought that something would happen right away. A comet would hit the earth, or it would stop blowing, start blowing up. What happened was worse. Everyone now lives in a constant state of worry and fear. New diseases are emerging and killing vegetation and humans was 10 times worse than COVID-19. But it isn't the viruses that are hurting people the most, it's mental health issues. In an already anxiety prone world, stress levels rise even more because of the fear of not knowing what will happen. Depression levels are magnified by the end of all humanity situation. So even though we ask people to think about the world they hope for, we still in the midst of 2020 got many stories like this that describes the world that they fear, the world that they think seems all but inevitable. But even here, we get the hints of an awareness of a desire for change, a calling out for change that is part of the work that dystopian fiction has always played in the realm of speculative fiction. The more we move out of the United States, the more there we heard of ideas of a different social structure, a different political structure on the planet, which displaces the superpowers in favor of mutual, a, a kind of global governance structure. So for the past two, here from Puppy from Da Nang, Vietnam, for the past two months since COVID-19 came, our daily routine has turned upside down as if our life has stopped. Medication and vaccines have not come out yet. This is truly terrible. Our future is bleak. Although in Vietnam, our government has strictly controlled the spread of COVID-19 and there has been no active cases for two weeks, we can't be complacent. Even in America that is praised as a free and rich country with exceptional health care, they couldn't cope with this pandemic. So many of the responses, we got an extra large number of responses from Vietnam because one of our students offered to translate from Vietnamese to English. 
And we heard often there a sense of that Vietnam had done a better job of dealing with COVID-19 than the United States, and that that was resulting in a questioning of the authority that the United States had played in world affairs. Uh, and Milo from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Compared to 2020 and 2060, our resources are scarce. Due to global warming, growth, growing food was not as easy as before. Find war, finding water is also complex following global warming. Most of the countries have polluted their sources of clean water. Otherwise, after five years of weather severity in the COVID-19 pandemic, all the countries decided to join forces to fix the planet. Now war is not a word in our vocabulary anymore. The deaths caused by pandemic and global warming effects have created a wave of peace in the world. Most of the people would like to remember the number of resources they had back in 2020. Some, some many, so many people and organizations warned about the risk for our planet. Unfortunately, global leaders decided not to hear it. And it's striking here, this contrast between the hopeful vision that all the countries decided to join forces to fix the planet and this more pessimistic vision of the current moment where the global leaders are not hearing the voices of people and organizations which are calling for change. And there's a kind of tension in the prose here between hopeful and dystopian visions. Here's a, I'm gonna close out with a couple of more examples that seem to sum up some of these themes. And then I wanna open it up to you for both your questions and any thoughts you have about these stories and what they might tell us. For me personally, I've given up too many times already, thinking about the situation, thinking I'm not able to overcome this. Why? Because the world is not meant for the weak and I'm not strong enough. Despite all the difficulties, despite all the things that dragged me down, I've always found a way to get back up and that's us, mankind. I've never been alone and neither have you. But in one way or another, when things get rough, we seem to isolate ourselves and we should know that you and me alone can't carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. So let's take this time to change, to strive for a better world, a world reborn of compassion and empathy. We can do it. We're capable of doing great things if we put our mind into it. And we've already taken so much from our world. Let's take less and give back more. And that's from Danielle or Daniel from Portugal, right, where, where you guys are now. So communication is vital to our survival, Manny says from Atlanta, where I am right now. Where there is no communication, there can be no community. And where there is no community, there is nothing. If imagine if people were able to thoroughly and attentively listen to someone who did not share their exact same beliefs, backgrounds, and experiences. Imagine if people were able to challenge the idea and not the person we would truly have the world at our fingertips. And finally, this is from Spain. It's a woman named Isabel writes, who lost her sister, Elena. And she wrote this letter to her dead sister of, from the future, talking about the world that, cap, that she sees in 2060. I hope you are well, wherever you are. It makes me thrilled to think you're reading this with your biggest and most genuine smile. I still remember when you were 22 years old, how excited you got thinking about the future, which kept you up every other night, imagining what the world would look like, things that would exist, things that would change. I would like to tell you that everything has changed, that there are flying cars, the cures for incurable diseases have been found, that poverty has ended, and that wars had stopped, but I would be lying to you. However, some things have changed. We've become more human. As humanity, we faced many challenges. After the pandemic that you lived and in which we lost you, we have fought many other and more lethal battles. We've struggled to understand the damage caused by our lifestyles of inseparable consumption. We bonded with each other, of course. We're no longer filled with hatred, selfishness, and individualism. Pain and necessity have changed us. I know you would be proud of the transformation we have achieved and even more so to be part of it. I love you. I miss you. 
I reminisce of you, your beloved sister, Isabel. To wrap things up, I want to turn back to Henry Giroux and his theoretical piece about COVID that I began with. And he writes about, he says, amid the corpses produced by neoliberal capitalism and COVID-19, there are also flashes of hope, a chance to move beyond the contemporary resurgence of authoritarianism, beyond the normalizing ideology of a poisonous cynicism and paralyzing conformity endemic to neoliberal capitalism. There's a growing movement to reclaim a collective political vision that is more compassionate, equitable, just, and inclusive. And I offer those voices from our civic, Atlas of the Civic Imagination as those flashes of hope. We see there a collective political vision that is not simply cynicism. Even when it has dark visions, it also contains within it other possibilities. And we see again and again in those quotes, a vision that is more compassionate, equitable, just, inclusive, and I would add sustainable than what we were seeing outside our windows as we lived through the pandemic, the political turmoils of last year. And that's what gives me hope as I look to the future. That's what provides me with a foundation for my own civic imagination.